on a beautiful sunny day in Holland, sitting here with uh, Mr. Gary Renard from the States. You brought us some nice weather. Thank you for that. Yeah, I brought you this nice California weather. Great. You're going to give a, a, a talk uh, this weekend? Yeah. Not yeah, the we're... first time? Uh, yes, in fact, both uh, Cindy and I are going to do the workshop this weekend. And we both have pretty new books out, which we're excited about. Mine in English is uh, The Lifetimes When Jesus and Buddha Knew Each Other. Uh, the subtitle is A History of Mighty Companions. And uh, that word and phrase, Mighty Companions, is borrowed from the Manual for Teachers in A Course in Miracles. Uh, it talks about an advanced teacher of God and how when he's ready to go on, he goes with mighty companions beside him. So that's where the subtitle uh, came from. And could you, uh, could you um, describe yourself as a mighty companion? Uh, I like to think so, but uh, you know, I don't want to uh, pretend that I'm enlightened or anything. Although I think that I'm certainly an advanced student. And I believe that I can be enlightened in this lifetime because my teachers in my fourth book told me that I could be if I worked hard enough. And when I say worked hard enough, uh, there's forgiveness work that needs to be done. Uh, in order to be enlightened, your mind has to be completely healed by the Holy Spirit. And that will happen by definition if you learn all of your forgiveness lessons in one lifetime. And that would include anything that comes into your mind, you know, including uh, any bad memories that you may have, for example. Uh, the ego, which is the fault you, which is based on separation, is very clever and wants to survive rather than being undone. And so it will come up with a hundred different ways to convince you that you're a body. And one of the ways that it does it is with bad memories, which uh, kind of like makes you identify with this as you. And of course there's sickness and uh, any kind of pain, uh, any kind of annoyance, upset, uh, anything that takes you out of the present and kind of like makes your mind wander, then uh, that's the ego at work. And of course miracle says you are far too tolerant of mind wandering. And too tolerant? Too tolerant of mind wandering and are uh, passively condoning your miscreations. And your miscreations are anything that is not God and his kingdom. So uh, it turns out, even though A Course in Miracles is difficult to do, its uh, ideas are actually pretty simple. There are not really trillions of things to choose between, like it appears. There are really only two things to choose between. There's God and his kingdom, or anything else. And anything else is not true. Uh, it's not real. The Course is very specific about that. Uh, it says, anything that is true is eternal and uh, cannot change or be changed. And that narrows it down quite a bit because there isn't anything in the universe that doesn't shift or change. So by definition, the Course Miracles is saying that nothing that we are seeing is true. This is all mind-made? Yes, it's all a projection that is coming from the unconscious mind. Uh, it's very much like being in a movie theater. You know, you're seeing a projection and your attention has been diverted to the screen. You, know, you so think you, it's real. Yeah, so you pay attention to the screen and you start to make the illusion real in your mind. It's like when you're in a movie theater, sometimes you'll forget that it's a movie and you'll get into it. and. Uh, you start arguing with the characters. Yeah. Oh, no, don't do that. Yeah, you may talk to the screen. Yeah. yeah. No, no, don't go there. Yeah. yeah. And you're drawn into the story. And you start to make it real in your mind, which is exactly what we've done with the world. We've invested our belief in the world. And because of that, the world can hurt us. You know, the world can affect us. Very much so. But the Course says about the kind of forgiveness that it teaches that it denies the ability of anything not of God to affect you. So what we're doing is we're taking that belief back from the world and we're putting it where it belongs, which is with reality, which is perfect oneness, which is also the Course's definition of heaven. You know, it describes heaven as the awareness of perfect oneness. It, it looks like there are a lot of people around me sitting here right now. That's right. And what is that that makes that distinction 
between you and me? Well, it's all based on separation. Hmm. Because uh, the idea that we could be separate from our Creator is what led to this projection in the first place. And everything that you see in the projection is based on separation, including the idea that there are separate bodies. So, because of the idea of separation, it looks like you're sitting over there and I'm sitting over here. That's an illusion. The truth behind the illusion is that we are one. So you have two complete and mutually exclusive thought systems. You have the thought system of the Holy Spirit, which is based on oneness and wholeness. Then you have the thought system of the ego, which is based on separation. And in fact, that's what time and space are. They're simply separation ideas. You know, so it looks like we're all separate and somebody's over there and I'm over here and somebody's up there. And, uh, you know, it's the same with time. There was really only one tiny tick of time, according to A Course in Miracles. But then through the device of separation, we took that one single instant and we divided it and subdivided it, you know, over and over and over again. That's separation too. So now instead of one instant, you have uh, millennia and centuries and decades and years and months and weeks, you know, and days and hours and minutes and seconds and nanoseconds, but it's all made up. But it's practical. Uh, well, it seems to be practical, but uh, eventually everybody runs out of time and their body dies. And, yeah. uh, you know, people want to people want to make the universe holy. They want to make it uh, spiritual. And the truth is that there's nothing spiritual about it because everything in it decays and dies. Uh, nothing in the world can live without something else dying, which is why A Course in Miracles uh, describes this as the dream of death. And it is very much a dream, uh, even though the idea that the world's an illusion is a very old idea, and it's been taught for thousands and thousands of years. By itself, that's not a very helpful idea. What you need to do is you need to replace it with something. Now, the first thing that A Course in Miracles does in replacing it is it refines the idea that this is uh, an illusion to the idea that this is a dream that you will awaken from. And it's that awakening that is enlightenment. That's what Buddha meant when he said, I am awake. And is it awake in the dream or awake out of the dream or with that's, the dream? That's a good question. Uh, he did not mean that he was more awake in the dream. Anybody can do that. He meant that he'd awakened from the dream. Ah. And that's not just a minor distinction. Because uh, when you awaken from the dream, then you realize that you are not at the effect of the dream. You are at cause and you are no longer a victim. The world is not being done to you, the world is being done by you. Now instead of being a figure in the dream, you're the dreamer. You're the one that the dream is coming from. And you start to realize that, and then you realize more and more that you're dreaming. And that's kind of like a prerequisite to awakening. You have to realize that you're dreaming. So of course a miracle says that awareness of dreaming is a function of the miracle worker. And the miracle worker is anybody who practices the Course's kind of forgiveness, which is coming from a place of cause and not effect. So if you're coming from a place of cause, you realize that it's, it's your dream, it's your projection. Uh, the projection is coming from the unconscious mind, and the unconscious mind is hidden uh, just the way that a projector in a movie theater is hidden. You're not supposed to turn around and look at the projector. You know, you're supposed to keep looking at the screen, which is exactly what the ego wants for us here. Uh, the ego wants us to make it real, because if we make it real in our mind, that means that the ego is real. And the ego wants separation to be true. And it senses that salvation or enlightenment, whichever you call it, is death to the ego. And because of that, the ego is afraid. And uh, the Course says that its range of emotions will suddenly shift from suspiciousness to viciousness, and that's where uh, illness and injury and all kinds of uh, you know, scary things come into play. And the Holy Spirit will say just the opposite. The Holy Spirit will say, actually, there is nothing to fear, that what you really are is not this body or the, any of these images that you see on the screen. What you really are is exactly the same as your Creator. So there are three basic, very important ideas that you have to put together with A Course in Miracles. Uh, the first one 
is that the full awareness of the atonement, and you could think of the atonement as just being correction, uh, the correction to the idea of separation. The full awareness of the atonement is that the separation never occurred. In other words, it never happened. We've never really left God. You know, that idea is impossible, according to the Course. And you're having this dream. So the Course says you are at home in God, dreaming of exile, but perfectly capable of awakening to reality. And the full awareness of the atonement is that you never left, that you're still there. Reality has not gone anywhere. In fact, it's still here, right now. And it's simply out of people's awareness, which is why the full awareness of the atonement is that the separation from God never occurred. And you seem to be having this dream of separation. And when you awaken from that dream, you will realize that you never really left, that you were there the whole time. It's like you're in bed at night, and you're having a dream, and dreams in bed at night can seem very real, almost as real, sometimes as real, as your waking, so-called waking life, which is also a dream. And uh, when you wake up from the dream, the dream is gone. It disappears, which is why my first book was called The Disappearance of the Universe, because that's really all that the universe is. A dream. is a dream that we will awaken from. But the second idea is that the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. So you have to accept the fact that you're dreaming and accept the fact that you never really left heaven and neither has anybody else. That's why they're innocent, which leads to the Course's kind of forgiveness. We don't forgive people because they've really done something. We forgive people because they haven't really done anything because you're the one who made them up in the first place. <laughs> You know, this is your dream, yeah. and they're simply figures in a dream. The Course describes people as images, and it says, The images you make cannot prevail against what God himself would have you be. And what God himself would have you be is with him in a state of perfect oneness, still at home in heaven. And it's possible to experience that perfect oneness even while you appear to be here. You know, even while you appear to be walking around in a body or, or sitting around having a sandwich or something, all of a sudden it's possible for you to have an experience of your perfect oneness with God and to remember what it's like to be in heaven with God. Uh, the Course calls that experience revelation, and it describes it as the complete but temporary suspension of doubt and fear. And in that experience, there is no doubt, which means there are no questions because uh, questions are a function of doubt. And there's no doubt or fear. There's perfect oneness, and you have a direct experience of God. Uh, the Gnostics uh, used to call that gnosis. And it means knowledge, but it's not intellectual knowledge. It's an actual experience of God. You can't and, put it into words, that experience. You're right. You can't put that experience into words. It's not possible. It's beyond all words. Uh, you can try to describe the experience, but it won't do it because words, uh, as the Course says, are but symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. And when you think about it, how is a symbol of a symbol ever going to make you happy? You know, how is it ever going to make you feel whole or full or complete or satisfied? You can't do it. Even a description of reality can't do it because it's still just words. But the actual experience, you know, the actual experience of being one with God at home in heaven, even if it just lasts for a second or two, will satisfy you because you'll realize that not only does that blow away anything that this world has to offer, but it gives you kind of like a preview of coming attractions. You know, it gives you a taste of what your permanent reality is eventually going to be like, and it encourages you to try to achieve it on a permanent basis even more. It's like an appetizer. You get a taste. Yes. So, the third idea is that the means of the atonement is forgiveness. And that's how you undo the ego. Uh, the Course says that salvation is undoing. And that's a brilliant approach because all that you have to do is undo the false you through forgiveness. Every time you practice a certain kind of forgiveness where you're coming from a place of cause and not effect and you're forgiving people because they haven't really done anything and they haven't really left heaven. And that's why they're innocent. And that's why you're innocent. And uh, you have to see them as innocent. 
And you can't get away from that because of the way that the mind works. If you could get down deep enough into the unconscious mind, then you would find out that there's really just one of us. It's kind of like the Hindus say, there's just one ego appearing as many. You know, so we look out there and we see, you know, uh, seven billion plus people. Well, that's what the Hindus call the world of multiplicity. And it's all illusion and it's not true. And there's a reality that is just beyond the veil and it's everywhere. And it's a constant state. So you have unreality, which is always changing. Then you have reality, which is a constant. And it doesn't change. That's what Jesus was talking about uh, 2,000 years ago. When he was talking about building your house upon the rock instead of on the sand. You know, the sand is always blowing away and it's always shifting and changing. And the rock stays the same. It doesn't change. So the truth was the truth 2,000 years ago. The truth is still the truth today. The truth will still be the truth 2,000 years from now. And it doesn't shift or change. And it's not subject to our interpretation. Uh, the truth is the truth, whether we understand and agree with it or not. And that's the position of the Course in Miracles. Now, of course, some people aren't going to like that idea because they want to find their truth. Their own truth. Yes, but the Course is saying, no, there's only one truth, and it's the same for everyone. And the ego's first law of chaos is that the truth is different for everyone because the ego is always trying to trick you, and it's a very clever illusionist, and it wants to keep you here. Because not being here would be the end of the ego. And uh, the ego doesn't want that and will always try to convince you that you're a body. In fact, that's the Course's definition of temptation. If you look in uh, the final section of the text of the Course, which is called Choose Once Again, it practically gives you the Course's definition of temptation, which is a little bit different than the way that people normally think about it. Uh, it starts right off by saying temptation has one lesson it would teach in all its forms, wherever it occurs. It would persuade the Holy Son of God, he is a body, born in what must die, unable to escape its frailty, and bound by what it orders him to feel. You know, so now the body is telling you what to feel, exactly the opposite of the way that it should be. You should be able to tell your body what to feel. And the way that you do that is you have to shift, once again, to a place of cause and not effect. So, uh, let's say that I'm feeling some pain in my knee. Mm -hmm. and I think maybe I'm getting arthritis or something. Well, the first thing I have to realize is that that pain is not really in my knee, it's in my mind. And that's where the projection of your body is coming from. It's, it's actually a projection that is coming from your mind, just like everything else. So, let's say I hold my hand up in front of my face here. What is that, really? Well, that is part of the same projection as that table over there. And it's no more real, and you don't have to take it any more personally than that table over there. Which is why uh, Jesus says in the Course, the body is outside of us and not our concern. So he didn't identify with his body. After a while, he didn't think of his body as being him. And we don't have to think of our bodies as being us either. We don't have to identify with the body. I mean, you wouldn't confuse yourself with being your car, you know, and yet you recognize that if your car is going to run properly, you put good things in it, like oil and gas and things like that. Well, you don't have to take your body personally either. You could say, okay, that's just a vehicle that I use temporarily uh, to get around in the dream, mm -hmm. and if I want it to work, then I'm going to put good things in it, and I'm going to take care of it. But that doesn't mean that I think that it's me. It's just a tool. Could, could you say the body is an extension of the ego? Yeah, uh, it's an ex well, the Course would use the word projection, projection of the ego, and it kind of reserves the word extension for God and His kingdom and the extension of love. So you have a thought system of love that comes from the Holy Spirit, and when you use that thought system, the Course would use the word extending or extension of love. And when you're thinking with the ego and teaching separation or coming from a place of fear or anger, then the Course would use the word projection. And the Course is uh, very clear about these things. You know, a lot of people think that the Course is vague and that it's hard to understand, but the Course is actually very clear about what it's saying. And it comes out many, many times in what my teachers in my books describe 
as definitive ideas, you know, definitive sentences. You know, so, for example, the one would be that the Course says, there is no world. That's an idea that's hard to get away from. <laughs> you know, it says there is no world. And it doesn't be vague about it. It doesn't say there is no world, yeah, but maybe. It says there is no world. This is the central idea the Course attempts to teach. That nothing here is true. And that's why the Course is a purely non-dualistic philosophy. Because it's saying of the two seeming worlds, the world of God and the world of man, only the world of God is true. And nothing else is true. Period. And these are the kinds of statements that you can't get away from. Yeah, I used to do a bunch of podcasts with a friend of mine in Florida. His name's Gene Bogart. And Is Gene, still available on uh, iTunes? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. We did about 50 of them. I think he still has them available. I'm not positive about that. But he used to say, uh, if you want to know what the Course says, maybe you should go by what it says. <laughs> And you have all these definitive statements in the Course that are very clear and uh, you know, really define what the Course is saying. Why is such a, a thick book? Is it a lot of repetition? Uh, you have to have repetition. You know, the truth is simple, but the ego is very complicated. Oh, so it has to hear it over and over and over again. Yes, the ego must be undone. Like a... Yes, and the I'm repetition not. in A Course in Miracles is ingenious. I mean, uh, it's been said that the text of the Course is six pages repeated a hundred different ways. But it's and necessary. That repetition is absolutely necessary. And uh, you'll find that as the ego is undone, you'll go back and you'll read something in the Course that you know that you've read before, but it's like you never saw it before. You know, because you're always getting these ideas on deeper and deeper levels. And the words haven't changed in the Course, but you have. You know, now you're seeing those words from a different place. As the ego is undone, you're seeing the words differently, and you're understanding them on a deeper and deeper level. And as you undo the ego, the Holy Spirit is healing your mind. The Holy Spirit is really taking care of the big part of the job. Our only responsibility, once again, the sole responsibility of the miracle worker, is to accept the atonement for himself. So, you don't have to save the world. You know, that's the Holy Spirit's job. And the Holy Spirit, according to the Course, devised a plan, looking back from the end of time, that uh, permitted for everybody to wake up at a particular time. So we're all going to awaken. We're all going to the same place. Nobody's going to be left out, uh, even the people who you think don't deserve to uh, go to heaven, because they're not going there as people. They're awakening from the idea of being a human being to the idea of being what they really are and where they really are. And this is why you have to think big. You know, I said you have to replace the idea of illusion with something. Well, when you're having a normal conversation with someone, and you should have normal conversations with people, don't forget how to be normal. You know, don't get so damn spiritual that you forget how to carry on a normal conversation with someone. You know, just uh, do B Buddha's middle way. You know, he uh, was very rich at the beginning of his life, and that didn't make him happy. And then he tried being an ascetic and renouncing the world and giving up everything, and that didn't make him happy either. So then he figured, okay, there's a middle way that I can go where I don't have to go to extremes. I don't have to try to be the richest man in the world, and I don't have to try to be the poorest man in the world. I can just be normal. And the great teacher of A Course in Miracles, Ken Wapnick, said the same thing. You know, he said, don't forget how to be normal. You know, so now you can live a normal life and you can practice forgiveness at the same time. And then you're what the Course describes as above the battleground. When you're forgiving, you're not stuck in it. You know, so you're looking at it from a different place now. You're looking at it with the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. And you get more and more prepared to forgive so that eventually, no matter what happens, you're ready to forgive. But what do you want uh, your forgiveness? You don't forgive a person. Do you forgive yourself? What do you forgive? You're forgiving what the ego is showing you. You know, you're not being taken in by appearances now. So, let's say someone is acting crazy, you know, and uh, they're insulting you. And they're, you know, kind of like pushing your buttons and making you feel uncomfortable. That's when you need to realize that you're thinking with the ego and stop it. 
and start thinking with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has a totally different story about what's happening. The ego wants you to make it real and think that that's a real person and you've got a real problem and you've really got to take care of it. And the Holy Spirit is saying the opposite. The Holy Spirit is in the right part of your mind reminding you that what you're seeing is not true, that what that person really is cannot be limited to the idea of being a body. And this is where you have to think kind of like outside the box. You know, you want to think big. Because what that person really is, is nothing less than God, which means they are not just part of it. You know, the Course teaches that uh, spirit is not a partial attribute. So what that person really is, is not part of it, but all of it. Uh, something that is bigger than the universe of time and space. Something that cannot be confined in any way to any shape or form. Uh, something that is limitless. So is it God in disguise? Uh, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, but it's not a very good disguise. Uh, <laughs> no, why not? Because people will act crazy, and God is not crazy. And the ego is insane, according to the Course. You know, so people will call out for help and call out for love in some very strange ways. You know, like shooting 20 people. And our job is to overlook the craziness of that person and realize that that person may be confused about what they are, but we know better. You know, I know that what that person really is is not that body that is acting crazy. What they really are is something that can't be confined like that, something that is exactly the same as God, and they've never left heaven. That's why they're really innocent, even though they may not know it. I know it. And once you know the truth, then you want to live it. You want to live the truth. So uh, Jesus could forgive anybody for anything, even when they seem to be destroying his own body. You know, he would forgive them. And, you know, today you have Christians who can't forgive people who have done nothing to them because they don't understand, and they're making it real in their mind. So now that person is really guilty and has really sinned and really deserves to be punished and really deserves to go to hell, and they have all these strange ideas. And the Course would say, no, the truth is they've never left heaven. That's why they're innocent, and that's why you're innocent. So I started to say, if you could get down deep enough into the unconscious mind, you would find out that there's really just one of us that there's really just one ego appearing as many. Now, that's good news and that's bad news. The bad news is that because there's really just one of us, and because your unconscious mind knows everything, it's kind of like uh, Carl Jung's collective unconscious. The unconscious mind knows everything, and it knows that there's really just one of us, because even the truth is buried there in the mind. That means that your unconscious mind will interpret anything that you think about another person to really be about you. Oh. And that's a pretty sobering thought. You know, people wonder why they're depressed. You know, they wonder why they're not happy in life. Just look at the garbage they've been thinking their whole lives about the world and about other people. Because they didn't know that those thoughts were really just going to them and that those thoughts would determine how they feel and ultimately, even what they believe they are. People are establishing their own identities right now. You know, so the Course says, once again, it's in that final section of the text, choose once again. It says, choose once again what you would have him be, knowing that every choice you make will establish your own identity, as you will see it and believe that it is. So if you're thinking that somebody is guilty and that they really did it, your unconscious mind will interpret that to mean that you are really guilty and that every bad thing that you think that you ever did or any bad or unkind word that you ever said to anybody in your life really happened and that you're really guilty. But if you can overlook the body, and the Course uses that word, overlook, uh, several times. If you can overlook the illusion of the world, if you can overlook the body and realize that, you know, that there's a truth that is everywhere that hasn't gone away, that is just beyond the veil, and it's really everywhere, and you can think of that person as being innocent because of what they really are, which is exactly the same as God, then that is how your unconscious mind is going to interpret you. And your unconscious mind will say, okay, you're innocent, you've never really left heaven, which is why you're innocent, and you haven't really done anything, and you are totally worthy of heaven, 
and totally worthy of being with God. And that's the truth. And heaven was given to you as a gift by God. You don't have to earn it. You know, you don't have to uh, earn your way back into heaven, like, uh, you know, Jesus' prodigal son story. You notice when the prodigal son was going home, he thought he was guilty. He says, oh, I've sinned before God, and I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. And what the prodigal son didn't realize was that God didn't share any of those ideas about him. Why? Because God is still perfect love, as both the Bible and the Course in Miracles say. God is perfect love. But I think we need to understand the implications of that. If God is really perfect love, then all that it would know how to do would be to love. You know, if it knew how to be something else or do something else, it wouldn't be perfect love. If it could have imperfect thoughts, then it wouldn't be perfect. So God is still perfect, which is good news for us, because it gives us a perfect home to go home to. And all that we need to do through forgiveness is undo the ego, forgive everything that comes up in our mind or what we see on the screen, uh, even what we see on television. You know, all the madness and the mayhem <laughs> that we see on our TV screens. Even Trump? Uh, you know, I hate to say it, but even Donald Trump needs to be forgiven because yeah. he's never really left heaven. He's confused about what he is. I mean, he thinks he's really the president, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, that's what people tell him. Yeah, and the truth is, uh, that's not what he is. And he may not awaken in this lifetime, but uh, he will at some point. In fact, that's already been established. It's already been ordained by the Holy Spirit when each one will awaken from the dream. And uh, a lot of Course in Miracles students will awaken from the dream in this lifetime and attain enlightenment. And my teachers in my fourth book told me that I may very likely do that in this lifetime. And I think that my wife Cindy will also. And uh, we were you know, scheduled in the ego's dream to come back 100 years from now and live another lifetime in Chicago, which is described uh, in my first couple of books. And they actually completed the story in the third book. So I thought maybe that was it, that there wouldn't be any more books, that it was a trilogy and that that would be it. But then I asked uh, my teachers, because I talked to them in my mind uh, when they're not around, because they appear to me in person for the books. But I talked to them in my mind when they're not around. And I asked him a question, because I was curious, you know, uh, how did Jesus get to be Jesus? You know, how did Buddha get to be Buddha? What were they like in the uh, incarnations just before they were Jesus and Buddha? What did they study? What did they do? What were their thought processes? What were the lessons that they had to learn? What did they go through? And the answer to that question uh, turned out to be a lot more than I bargained for. <laughs> and my teachers uh, gave me enough information for a whole new book. And that's where the fourth book came from. It's about uh, six different lifetimes that Jesus and Buddha shared together, the things that they learned, and how they eventually became completely uncompromising about this idea that there is a constant reality that you should invest your belief in, and that there is an illusory changing illusion that you should not invest your belief in. And they learned how to choose God and his kingdom. As we already said, the Course teaches be vigilant only for God and his kingdom, which grants you is a pretty tall order, but they eventually got to that point in their final lifetimes. And you can see by the end of uh, Buddha's lifetime in the book that they have become totally uncompromising and they decided that they had to recognize God as the only reality and acknowledge God. Uh, even in uh, the lifetimes where there were teachers that were teaching that there was this constant thing that was reality. They were not calling it God, and they were not acknowledging God. And the truth is, you can't undo the idea of separation from God without acknowledging God. Of course. You know, it wouldn't be possible. So, they recognized eventually, and you see this very much in uh, Jesus' final lifetime. The book is now in Dutch? Uh, yeah, the book just came out yeah, in great. Dutch. Looks great. I have a great publisher, uh, Annelies, and great translators, and they did uh, what everyone says is an excellent job. And one, one uh, uh, how do you call it in English, recension, or uh, uh, a review, says that the bo this book shocks the world, and that's what he likes about it. Is it a shocking book? No, it shocked me. <laughs> yeah? Uh, I wasn't prepared for it. it. It has a lot of things in it that I didn't know. Uh, there are a lot of great stories about Jesus and Buddha. There are a lot of uh, teachings that I didn't know about 
that they learned. And uh, it made me want to be like them. You know, it really inspired me to want to be like them, to be uh, completely uncompromising with the truth and uh, to not give in to appearances. Because the ego will try very much to, uh, to trick you and fool you into thinking that this is your real life and uh, that your happiness depends on getting what you want. Well, what if it didn't matter what happened? You know, that's heresy to the ego. Yeah. <laughs> of course it matters. Of course it's important that I get what I want. But what if it wasn't important? What if you could be happy and peaceful regardless of what happens? There are stories of people who are in the concentration camps in the war who saw this. Yes, that's, absolutely. That gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Yes, and if they can do it, anybody can do it. But you have to want it. You have to want the results. You know, the Course says about the words, I want the peace of God. It says to say these words is nothing, but to mean these words is everything. And I think you have to want it. I think you have to desire to be with God. Is, is there a, cri a crisis needed to want it really deeply, or is it independent of circumstances in the world? Should I first lose my wife, crash my car, lose my family, and then willing to accept this? Uh, no, all that you need to do is be able to forgive whatever comes up. Now, unfortunately, tragedies and crises are going to happen anyway, <laughs> whether we want them or not. You know, that's the ego script. And uh, the ego script is all based on separation. And there's no better example of separation than death and losing people who are the closest to you, which will happen to all of us if we live long enough. It means, you know, if you live to be in your hundreds, well, everybody who you know is going to die, and you're going to have to watch them die. Even if you're the most successful person in the world, even if you have the most money in the world, you still have to go through that. And the Course is saying, that you can be peaceful because you know that you can never really lose that person, that you are with them at home in heaven, that you will both awaken to that, and that you will be even closer to them in heaven than you could possibly be here. Because heaven is a condition of perfect oneness. And you are closer to them than your own heart. And when you have that experience of revelation, which is also a very sexual experience. Uh, you know, people don't like it when I talk about that, but it's like a constant orgasm that never stops. Sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> it is great. And uh, I've experienced it, and I think that uh, anybody can experience it if the Holy Spirit thinks that it's a good idea for them to experience it in this lifetime. They may have already experienced it uh, in another lifetime that came before this one. Because most of the people who study A Course in Miracles are not spiritual beginners. Mm -hmm. you know, they've had a background, they've studied spirituality in other lifetimes, other incarnations, and then they pick up A Course in Miracles and they start to read it. And even if they don't understand it right away, which nobody does, I mean, how could you? The first miracle principle is there is no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not harder or bigger than another. They are all the same. I don't know how anybody could possibly pick that up and have mm -hmm. any idea what the hell that means. You know, and it takes uh, repetition all through the Course to start to get the hang of it, and most people never do. And the Course ends up sitting on your bookcase. It uh, scares somewhere. me for the first time. When I saw it, I opened it up, I read a few sentences, oh, no more excuses after this. Yeah. Go away, book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, interestingly enough, a lot of people will recognize, even if they don't understand the Course right away, they will recognize the authority of the voice of the Course. There's a recognition there with a lot of people. They'll, they'll see what the voice is saying and the way that it's being said, and they'll say, yes, that's a voice of authority. That's a voice that is speaking the truth. And a lot of people recognize that right away. I did. You know, I didn't understand the Course when I first picked it up, but I could see, you know what, uh, this is Jesus. And it really is the voice of Jesus. It speaking. didn't scare you? Uh, no. But in my case, you know, I started talking to Jesus in my mind uh, when I was a child. And I didn't know why. And it wasn't a religious thing. You know, I've never been religious. You know, I, I like to say, in, in the winter, I'm a Buddhist. In the summer, I'm a nudist. <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, I never was a churchgoer. I would go to church twice a year, you know, Easter and Christmas. And I just couldn't buy what they were saying. You know, uh, how Jesus suffered and sacrificed himself for my sins. 
And I'm thinking, first of all, what are my sins? Uh, you know, I stole some candy once, but that's hardly worthy of a death sentence. And what kind of a God would sacrifice his only son as a blood sacrifice to atone for people's sins? It, it just didn't make sense to me. But when I did look in the Bible and I saw some of the other things, like Jesus practicing uh, forgiveness in a completely uncompromising way, saying even when he's dying, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Well, that's a pretty good description. When you see uh, people murdering each other on television, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they're really just doing it to themselves and that that's how their mind will interpret it. So they don't know what they're doing. But if you know, then you want to live according to what you know. Uh, you know, it's an old Chinese uh, saying, to know and not yet do is to not yet know. <laughs> if you don't do it, you don't really know it. It's just a, an intellectual exercise that's like an entertainment or you know, something to amuse you. And that's not the purpose of A Course in Miracles. The, the purpose of the Course is to actually do it in such a way that you will awaken in God. And you'll notice toward the end of the workbook in the Course, uh, some of those lessons involve an actual approach to God. Because there's this unconscious fear of God that people have that they don't really know about. It. They'll experience it a little bit, so you'll hear about the fear of God in the Bible or something. But there's this terrible unconscious fear that people don't know about. And once that fear is gone, then not only will they not fear God, but they will not fear death either. Uh, both the Course and the Bible also say that the last to be overcome shall be death. And Jesus agrees with that in the Course. And he says, of course, you know, because the last two obstacles to peace in A Course in Miracles are the fear of death and the fear of God. And you would not have one without the other. If you didn't have this fear of God, if it went away, then you would no longer fear death either. And it leads to a fearless way of being. And uh, the Holy Spirit has always existed. You can see some of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, even though the Bible is a mixed bag and has a lot of ego in it. Uh, there are also a lot of things from the Holy Spirit in the Bible, like the Psalm of David, when it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Uh, it's kind of funny that people have that read at their funerals, because it's not about death. It's about a fearless way of living. And that's what A Course in Miracles eventually leads to. It leads to the knowledge and the experience that what you really are is something that, like Jesus, is this perfect oneness with God, that is something that is immortal, invulnerable, you know, something that can't be touched by anything in this world, something that can't be threatened by anything in this world. So when the Course starts right off by saying nothing real can be threatened, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about your reality. It's talking about what you really are and where you really are. And when it says nothing unreal exists, well, that would be anything else. Anything else that is not immortal and invulnerable and perfect oneness with God. And herein lies the peace of God. Well, the peace of God is there because it involves a choice. Uh, the Course is always asking us to make a choice between one of two things. Are we going to overlook the illusion, overlook the dream, and think in terms of reality? Or are we going to make the dream real? Uh, the Holy Spirit thinks in terms of oneness. So at one point, the Course says, everywhere the Holy Spirit looks, he sees himself. You know, the Holy Spirit overlooks bodies and sees innocence everywhere. But you can't make any exceptions to that. And so, you know, 2,000 years ago, uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, who were married, and they were both enlightened, and they forgave everybody and everything. Even when uh, you know someone was killing someone, you know the Romans were killing someone, they could still think of the Roman as being what they really are and where they really are. And uh, today Christianity would say, well, that person doesn't deserve it. But we forgive people not because we're being good or charitable. We forgive people because what we're seeing is not true. And we overlook what is not true in favor of reality, and by choosing reality, we make it real for ourselves. So ultimately, you're the one who's being forgiven when you forgive, and ultimately, it's a gift that you're really giving to yourself. And you will experience the benefits of it. You'll feel better, uh, you'll feel younger, 
you know, I started doing A Course in Miracles uh, 25 years ago, and I don't feel any older today than I did 25 years ago. And your body will start to feel lighter uh, instead of this thing that you have to carry around all the time. It'll start to feel more like the figure in a dream that it really is. Maybe it'll feel more uh, flexible, more elastic. Maybe it will become more difficult to hurt it. Maybe you'll get in a little accident, you know, and uh, you hurt yourself, but it doesn't hurt. And you'll think, well, that's odd. Uh, that should hurt, but it doesn't. And you'll start to realize that there are fundamental changes that are taking place in your unconscious mind because your mind is being healed by the Holy Spirit every single time you practice forgiveness. Even if it looks like you're forgiving the same thing over and over again, you feel stuck in a relationship. Uh, you feel stuck in a job that you don't like. Even if it looks like you're forgiving the same thing, the Course teaches that the Holy Spirit is always performing some kind of a healing every single time, which is why it says that a miracle is never lost. You know, it's never wasted. It can have undreamed of effects in situations of which you are not even aware. So every single time you do it, the Holy Spirit is doing the big part of the job. Your mind is being healed. The ego is being undone. The right part of your mind where the Holy Spirit dwells is slowly but surely taking over your entire mind. And when the time comes that you have forgiven everything and get to the point where the world cannot affect you, where it can't bother you, then you've won. And when you lay your body aside for the final time, as the Course teaches, then you awaken in God. And that experience of revelation that I described or tried to describe becomes your permanent reality and you're at home. And then you find out that you never really left. You realize that you never really left and neither, neither did anybody else because in perfect oneness, nothing can be missing. You know, nothing can be left out. And the experience of that is so beautiful and so amazing and so much more real than this world, you know, which is temporary and fleeting and transitory at best. And this is something that has a feeling of permanence to it. It's so much better that there's unbridled joy and you can't contain yourself so you extend into infinity. And uh, that's why it can't be described in terms of this world because it's just so different from this world. And the Course teaches you would be surprised how different reality is from the world that you are experiencing. But it's worth going for. And the irony is that you can have your life too. You know, you don't have to give up anything. The Course is not called for sacrifice. So, you can still have your life, you can still have your job, uh, you can still have money, possessions, you can still have your goals, you know, you can still have sex, you can still have all the things that everybody else has. The only difference is, is that you're looking at it differently now. You're looking at it with the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. You are above the battleground. And, What's going to happen is that you're going to end up enjoying your life more. And there's a beautiful irony to that because as you forgive and the Holy Spirit heals this unconscious guilt that was in your mind that you didn't even know about that could be traced all the way back to the original idea of separation from God. As you have less guilt in your mind, you actually end up enjoying your life more. And it doesn't matter that it's an illusion. It's not going to prevent you from enjoying it. Like when I go into a movie theater, which is one of my hobbies, I know that it's not real, but that doesn't stop me from enjoying it. Yeah. I still enjoy the movie. You're willing to forget that it's a movie. Yeah, and uh, if something bad happens in the movie, well, uh, I can forgive it, because I know that it's not real. I know that it's not true, but that's what this life that we thought was reality can be like. Uh, we can forgive anything because we know that it's not real and that it's not true, and yet the good things can still be enjoyed. So the Course is teaching that there are really only uh, two attitudes that you should have. If something happens that you don't like, something that affects you, you know, somebody comes into the room who you can't stand, a politician comes on the TV screen who you don't like, uh, you can forgive them and then you'll be peaceful. And if you've really forgiven them, the way that you'll know it is that the next time that person comes into the room, they won't have any effect on you. Mm -hmm. The next time that politician comes on the TV screen, he or she won't have any effect on you. And that's how you know that you've forgiven something, when it doesn't bother you anymore, when you're not annoyed anymore. 
it reminds me of, of, of children around the age of six or seven. They not bothered if it's raining or if, if it's crowded. They just go go about on their on their on their journey. Yeah. Is, yeah. This, is that what he meant? He meant it would be childlike. Jesus yes. Said. Yes. He should become like a little child. I think that's exactly what he meant. And uh, life actually becomes more fun. And it's not that you're not going to have problems. I mean, I'm not saying that if you do this, that everything is going to go good. You know, you look at Jesus at the end of his life. You know, things weren't exactly going good. The point is, it didn't matter. You know, because he could be peaceful regardless of what happens. So what's going to happen in your life, because this is a universe of dualities, you're going to have good and you're going to have bad. And sometimes you're going to get what you want, and sometimes you won't. And when you don't, you can forgive it. And the Course teaches that when it comes to people, uh, you can forgive them if it's called for. But if there's nothing to forgive, then you should celebrate. You know, so uh, we don't have to find something to forgive with everybody. We can just have a good time with them. We yeah. can celebrate. Yeah, I don't feel like I have a lot to forgive uh, with Cindy, you know, I, so we can celebrate. We can have a good time. And we go out to dinner and we laugh so hard that uh, sometimes the other customers get annoyed at us because we're laughing so much. But life is meant to be fun. And one of the characteristics of a teacher of God in A Course in Miracles is joy. And it says, delay of joy is needless. And that's what forgiveness leads to. It leads to uh, happiness. It leads to good things. And it will also lead to inspiration. Now, a lot of people, uh, you know, they want to make money, but they want it to look spiritual. <laughs> you know, so they use all these techniques, like the law of attraction or whatever, to attract money to themselves or possessions to themselves. And uh, A Course in Miracles actually has something better than that. And that's inspiration. In fact, uh, the word inspired comes from the words in spirit. And the more the Holy Spirit comes to dominate your mind, the more you will be inspired. And inspired ideas are like genius level ideas that will tell you what to do. The Holy Spirit can actually guide you through life. You know, so let's say that uh, you have a business. You know, and this can be very uh, practical. You have a business and you can't quite figure out how to make it work. You know, how to make money. And then you'll be sitting around and you won't be doing anything special. And an idea will come into your mind and you'll go, oh yeah, that's it. I should try that. And you try it and it works. And that's when you'll start to get excited about those kinds of ideas that just seem to come to you from out of nowhere. It doesn't feel like you thought of it. Yeah. You know, like you talk to people who have done something great and you'll ask them, hey, uh, that was a good idea. How'd you think of that? And they'll say, well, it just came to me. Eureka. Yeah. <laughs> That's an inspired idea. And it's also from the word enthusiastic, I once heard, on to, from God. Yes, that's, that's great. And it'll show up in all kinds of different areas. Uh, not just business, but you know, let's say uh, you come down with some kind of an illness. Well, the Holy Spirit may guide you to the way to treat that illness. And even though it involves illusions, and uh, magic in the Course is just simply using illusions to heal illusions, so the Course will teach that, well, that's not a real cure. You know, only salvation can be said to cure. You know, the only real cure is in the mind. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit will guide you to very practical things. You know, I believe that for every uh, disease and every illness in the world, there is a treatment somewhere that will work. And that is simply true because this is a world of duality. So for every good you have a bad, and for every bad you have a good. And it does equal out although those two are always going in and out of balance, you know, like the yin and the yang, ultimately, for every bad thing in the world, there's a good thing to counteract it, if you can find it. And what I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit can lead you to that. The Holy Spirit can inspire you to that. And because the ego is so complicated, and because everybody's different, uh, the Course teaches that the curriculum is highly individualized, even though the truth is still the same for everybody. Uh, the circumstances that need to be forgiven are not going to be the same for everybody. But the good news is, is that if you can completely forgive everything in this lifetime, including anything that comes into your mind, whether it's a, a thought or a, or a memory uh, or uh, anything that makes you uncomfortable, anything that you see in the world, if you can get to the point where the world cannot 
hurt you, where it cannot affect you, and that you're peaceful all the time, uh, you can attain enlightenment by forgiving this one lifetime. Because the lessons that you're being confronted with in this lifetime are the same lessons that you were confronted with in all the other lifetimes. They may look different, but that's just the illusion. The content, the meaning is still the same. So sure, things look different today than they did 500 years ago. But a lesson that you had 500 years ago is the same in content as a lesson that you have in this lifetime. And to forgive it in one lifetime is to forgive it in every lifetime, because the content of those lifetimes, past, present, and future, are really all the same. So if you can forgive everything in, in this lifetime, it's possible to be enlightened in one lifetime. And people have done it in half a lifetime. And I've known a couple of people who I'm sure were enlightened. They're no longer uh, in the body, but they're at home with God. And once you're enlightened and once you're at home with God, you don't ever come back. You know, uh, you don't have to come back and save the world. Once again, that's the Holy Spirit's job, and the Holy Spirit is very good at it. And uh, that part is taken care of. But what you need to do is to f accept the atonement for yourself and to forgive everything uh, that does affect you. And if you do that, you're doing your job. The means of the atonement is forgiveness. We're only asked to do one thing, and that is this kind of forgiveness where you're forgiving people not because they really did it, but because they haven't really done anything. And in, in acknowledging that, that's how you get in touch with your own divinity. That's how you get in touch with your own innocence. That's how Jesus and Mary did it 2,000 years ago. And today, in A Course in Miracles, uh, his message hasn't changed at all from 2,000 years ago. But it can be put in a way that we can understand it on a much deeper level, which accelerates our awakening. So now we're being taught to forgive exactly the same way that Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. And in A Course in Miracles, he's kind of like uh, an older brother. You know, he doesn't present himself as being anything special. You know, he says, there's nothing about me that you cannot attain. And he's saying, in fact, you will be like me, and you will awaken from the dream. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And when, a lot of that determines, uh, depends on how bad you want it. And if you want it badly enough, then you will practice forgiveness. And if you don't want it badly enough, then you won't practice forgiveness. Yeah, and it's not much different than uh, being a professional musician. You know, if you want to be a really great piano player, then you'll practice. Yeah. And uh, if you don't want it bad enough, if you don't have that desire, then you're not going to practice. Forgiveness is no different. Uh, if you want the peace of God, and if you want to go home to God, which is a personal decision, you know, not everybody is ready to go home to God. Not everybody is ready to quit being human and, you know, go back to spirit. But that time is appointed for everyone. And if it is your time, you know it. And if A Course in Miracles is for you, then you know it. And if it's not, well, then this isn't your time to be doing it. And it's not that complicated. But if you want it badly enough, like I do, and like many students of A Course in Miracles do, then they'll do that forgiveness homework of theirs that is required to undo the ego. And it's as simple as that. But it's something that is well worth doing. And it's well worth experiencing. And as I said, you don't have to give up your life either. You can still have all the same things. It's just that now you're above that battleground. Sounds great. Can you put up the book for us, uh, Gary? Yeah, this is the book in Dutch. Look. Just just came out. Yeah, you look proud. Yes. You should be. I am. Um, we're in the same room with your beautiful wife, Cindy. Um, should we take a little break and then talk a little further with uh, Cindy on your side, or maybe talk to Cindy because she had a book. Uh, she has a book also on this subject. Sure, she can sit right next to me. Okay, great. I'll, Let's be, have some I'll be quiet most of the time. She can talk a little bit. Thanks, Gary. Sure.